George Miller joins me in Studio Q. Hello. Hello. How are you? Doing well. So this was uh, your firstborn, so to speak, Mad Max. <laughs> um, what was it like to return to that world decades later? Well, it felt like going back to an old hometown and seeing it again for the, for the first time. Um, hmm. uh, it, was, it was kind of stepping back in time and yet, um, uh, you know, it, the world had moved on so much. Uh, movies had changed. Audiences have changed. The way we make movies have changed. And so it was, a, it was an interesting thing to go back, hmm. a bit bit demented but but still interesting <laughs> demented how so well we did the whole film old school uh real world that we don't defy the laws of physics um no flying men there are no spacecraft it's not a green screen or cg movie it was real cars and real people in a real desert hmm. and um and, and 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 they're pretty you know it was 130 days of shooting with big stunts, big stunt days every day. So um, it was pretty wild, uh, but um, but it was really interesting. It was fun to go back and do something that, like that, particularly after animations. What was behind the decision not to do any of the green screen special effects type of uh, stuff for the stunts? Because it would have looked fake. Hmm. You know, if you've got a real car kicking up dust and, and stuff, smashing and rolling in the dust or people sort of, you know, way, way out there in the desert of Namibia having a big sort of, you know, fight as as, as Max and Furiosa, uh, Tom Hardy and Charlize Theron's character get together and uh, and they go at it. Uh, if, if you did that kind of in the... In, in, in the way that we see it a lot nowadays, it just would look, look fake. It had to be down down in the dirt and gritty. Would that um, lower the stakes for viewers too? Do you find when it's all it's it's visibly fake? Yeah, when I when I, you know, when I go to the cinema, I want to sit there in the dark with strangers and just get sucked up into the screen. And anything that gets in the way of that just. You know, you know, keeps you out of the experience. That's what we. That's what we all want. Well, back in 1979, you had to do things that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever miss that? Those parameters. Um, I. Y y yes and no. I mean, back back then, you know, when we did Road Warrior, which we just heard, mm -hmm. it took us a week to see our dailies. We had to send it to from from the outback of Australia. To to you know the the nearest lab in Sydney. Um, now we see it instantly, and not only that, many cameras, digital cameras. We we shot with the sm smaller digital cameras, and you can put them anywhere. We had extraordinary uh, equipment, like a thing called the Edge, which is a very powerful four wheel drive. Uh, driven by a three-headed creature one was a driver <laughs> one was a, 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 a you know a, a crane operator with toggle switches and there was camera operator and me in the back with him with the screen and that camera could go anywhere inches mm. off the ground underneath the vehicles right up close to the actors and so on it was like really like being in a real video game and and wow. you, you couldn't reproduce that uh, CG and sort of get the kinetics and the, and the rawness of it. Um, different than the old days as well is that when when you see Max hanging upside down between the wheels of a massive war rig as it's hurtling through the wasteland, um, that's really Tom Hardy. If you turn your head upside down, have a look, <laughs> you'll see that it's Tom Hardy. But he was harnessed with two very strong cables by a really, really fine rigging stunt crew, and we could erase the cables. You can erase all your rigs. So, yeah. so you couldn't do that in the old days. It, 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 it was, you, you know, you, so it would have been a stunt guy, and you you might have been able to hide the cables, but not as safely as you could now. Another big difference between that time and now is you were making a career change from medicine to directing back in the 1979. Yeah. What made you want to? take a chance and leave that career behind? Well, it wasn't like leaving one thing and starting another. Um, in, in those days in Australia, there was no real career in film. Uh, we filmmakers who started making films back then were just 
very enthusiastic and making movies and you you never knew if it was ever going to if it was ever going to be successful, you just did the best you can. Mm. So I stayed on as a doctor, uh, working as a doctor, even after Road Warrior. And then at a certain point, I realised that I was forgetting med- medicine. I <laughs> I went through medical school with my twin brother, and mm. as time went on, I realised that you know I, I was just forgetting a lot of it. And by then, um, uh, by then, you know, I just kept making movies. And by then, Mad Max had had a huge impact on popular culture as well. Were you surprised at the impact? Was there a moment where you realized, wow, this this movie has really touched people? Yes, there was, definitely. I mean, the movie was such a low budget. Uh, we, And it was the first time I'd really been on a movie set. I, I, I learned to make movies just by going to the movie theaters and watching and, and, and thinking a lot about movies. I made a couple of short movies, um, but they only had crew about three or four people and here we were doing a big stunt, a stunt movie and uh you know and, and a drama and and but um I spent a year cutting the movie um uh, by myself with my producing partner Byron Kennedy cutting the sound so uh and when that, in that year I was able to watch all my mistakes all the things I wanted to do um and yet somehow when it got out around the world in Japan, they recognised Max as a kind of lone samurai, a Ronin samurai, and uh, and then in Scandinavia, a, a lone wa- a Viking uh, wandering the wasteland in search of some sort of meaning. And the French were first to see that it was a kind of Western on wheels. And suddenly, I, I suddenly realised then that it was something much more than just the film we we made. We we t- tapped into an archetype. Huh. Uh, and uh, and by the time we did the second one, that was much more sort of conscious on that. It, it was it was it, it, you know I remember the feeling of relief that uh, the, the the film succeeded, and also a sense of wonder that somehow there is out there a collective unconsciousness that hmm. we tap, tapped into. And basically, it was a classic Joseph Campbell hero myth, and I think that's why why these kind of characters. I guess, guess even predated cinema. They, they're told throughout all, yeah. all throughout folklore and, uh, and and mythology. I think. What about other aspects of the film, like the sparse dialogue or the um, this the the punk apocalyptic aesthetic and the influence of those things? Were you surprised at the ways those were influential? Um, it, it like even with this one, it comes out of a, a kind of logic. Uh, mm. um, the you know, I really, really liked uh, action movies. They were a kind of pure use of the film language. Uh, I really caught up even pre-sound, you know, the films of Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, um, the, the, the the Westerns and, and all of those, and then going on through uh, the, the 70s. And, and the, the, you know, Alfred Hitchcock had a great saying, I try to make films where they don't have to read the subtitles in Japan, so mm-hmm. meaning that it's a visual medium, visual language. That's what you visual mean by language. the language of film. Yeah, exactly, visual mm-hmm. language, and um, and it's very exciting. It's like music. It's like putting notes together in a certain order. There's a certain certain progression uh, in in order to make an experience for an audience. So I like to call these kind of movies visual music, and mm-hmm. uh, and um, so. Uh, yeah, that was that that was the thing that sort of drove those movies, and then to see what you could get out of the subtext in in in, in telling these stories, and that's exactly the motivation that kicked off this movie, uh, Fury Road. Uh, an idea came to me. I didn't want to make another Mad Max movie. I'd already <laughs> made three, and I kept, you keep pushing it away, and it keeps coming back, and it, it develops, and you get excited about by, by its potential, and then soon you find yourself saying, we'll make another Mad Max movie. So you kind of wanted to tap into that pure language of film again? Yeah, very much, yeah. And, and you know, in the 30 years since the last ones, uh, not only the world's changed and, and I've changed, I hope, uh, but, but the way we view films has changed. We kind of s- speed read movies now. Mm. We, can, we, can, we, can, we can see them very, very quickly. The, you know, the... the, the 
Road Warrior, the second Mad Max, had 1,200 cuts. This one has 2,700 cuts, wow. almost the same amount of time. That's happened to all of cinema. They, they, they're getting faster and faster and faster. How hard is it to adapt to that sort of change? That, that wasn't difficult. I mean, um, uh, you know, I, I, what, I'm drawn most of all by story and then being able to work with the tools as they come along. You know, when we made the Babe movies, it took us a while to even have the technology uh, to make a pig talk. You know, it was before it was before uh, digital uh, filmmaking, and then uh, when I saw the first motion capture that came out of New Zealand, where they made Gollum move, and I realised you could make a penguin dance. So I was drawn to that technology. But first of all, what what had primacy was was the story. I want to ask you quickly, I read that um, your years as a doctor heavily influenced your first Mad Max movie. How so? Well, you know, um, I, I grew up in an isolated rural town in Australia and big wide roads and the car was had very significant in that. So I saw car culture from that point of view and then I switched the point of view when I worked in a big city hospital in trauma in emergency and saw that dark side of the mm. car culture, order side, and, 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 uh, and that sort of seeped into me and that's basically what drove the first Mad Max character to see how it would be affected by, by seeing the death of his friend and his, his family and, and what would happen. And that, that kind of uh, triggered off that character. But our budget was so low that we couldn't afford to shoot in streets full of people and other cars. So we shot in back streets and we, we couldn't afford to hire uh, you know, normal buildings. So we went to dere- derelict buildings and shot there for nothing. And, uh, mm. that, and to explain that, I, I added the caption at the beginning a few years from now and that sort of kicked it off being into the future somehow. And, uh, and, and, and uh, yeah. Hmm. That's, so you talked about this pure language of film and how action films are like that, almost like silent movies are, this pure language of film. But you went away for, from action for a while. What made you want to come back? Well, again, I... Um, I'd done animations. I, I, I really explored that, that you know, that digital technology, and there was something enticing about going back and doing something old school. Uh, it, it's like putting the band together back again, together, you know? yeah. And uh, and and uh, you know, it was tough. It was hard on everyone, but but we we really had a fine crew of people and. Uh, Stunt crew, camera crew, rigging crew, special effects crew. The actors were up for it. Uh, there were actors like, um, you know, Tom Hardy was not only extremely versatile, a fine actor, but he was also a rugby player. So he, knew, you know, he's up for the physical side of it. Mm-hmm. Charlize, she was, uh, she'd been an accomplished ballet dancer. So she had that sort of physical discipline. Um, and ditto Nick Holt and Josh Hellman and the, and the, everybody else got involved. So that that was interesting. And to go out there into the middle of the Namibian desert in such an isolated place, and we kind of shot in continuity. It was almost felt almost felt like a real road war itself, you know, hmm. uh, just just charging across that wasteland with all all. All these armies, as it were. In continuity, you mean from front to back? You shot the sequence. Yeah, almost. Yeah, By almost. continuity, I mean uh, in in sequence. We mm-hmm. we didn't chop around. So because it was such a you know attrition and impact on the vehicles, it was hard to guess after a crash what it would look like. So yeah. you have to do it in, 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 in you know in chronological order, as it were. And same to the people. If you know they each get. Most of the characters get knocked around one way or the other, so it's a, it's the more sensible way to do it. So over the course of your career, you you've had such an eclectic range of films. How hard has it been along the way to convince people, for example, after doing the first Mad Max films, that hey, I can do drama, or <laughs> Eric family friendly films? 
Was that a challenge along the way? Never really. It was uh, to, honestly, it was always story driven. We did television. We were in a fortunate posi- position where all our television miniseries worked really well. Um, I, you know, I, yeah, most most of the time, we were eclectic, eclectic enough at the beginning so that people sort of, if they, it, it really depends on the script. If the, if the script's strong enough and the story's strong enough. By the time people turn the, the last page of your script, the, the the only question they have is how much and when. Uh, mm. That tends to happen. You know, Babe, we wrote the script, we planned it, we had a budget. Uh, the first studio that read it said we really like this. Um, um, initially everyone thought it was a joke to tell a story about a talking pig. But I knew that in, in Babe himself was a kind of – Hero, you know, he he followed the the pattern of the classic hero myth. He was mm. the, the agent of change in his world, uh, and that was an interesting thing to do. So, and then you know, yeah, it never uh, it, it it usually depends on just how a story takes hold of me. Yeah, uh, I I I can't. As I say, I keep pushing them away and those that are the most insistent, I find myself getting very enthusiastic about. And if you're enthusiastic and you have a track record uh, and you have a relationship with the studios, you uh, people usually, you know, are happy to make the films. Why is your instinct to push them away at first? Well, particularly the Mad Max movies. Um, mm. uh, I just didn't. You know, after the first one, I didn't want to make a second one. And, and as I said before, when I realised that hey, we've tapped into into this world, and it was an opportunity after feeling that the first one, I just I just didn't really succeed. Uh, hmm. And I learnt so much on the first one that to do it a second time was 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 a great a great thing. And so it was the third one, and then it was time to move away from that world and. And over the years, people were asking me about it, and I just my mind wasn't going there. Mm. And then suddenly it did. You know, I think what happened, and it's only recently I realised when I made the first Mad Max movies, I didn't have any kids. Then kids, I had kids, so I tended to watch a lot of family movies, <laughs> and that kind of seeped into my brain. So I was alert to those sort of stories. And now my kids have grown up, I can go huh. back to Mad Max. Maybe you're trying to make the kind of movies you wanted to watch or something. Yeah. yeah. Do you have kids? I don't, unfortunately, well, not yet. when you have kids, you kind of stop going to the movies because you can't just get up there and say, hey, let's go and see a movie. So, But then you watch lots and lots of a, a kid of kid films, you know. Mm. And kids, you know, when they – you know how they want the same story over and over again? They'll watch the same movie over and over until they get what they want from it. Yeah. From it, it's somehow – informing them about things that they're interested in life. It's There's something happening when kids watch movies. Hmm. Uh, they take what they need, they examine it, they and then and then suddenly they'll drop that movie and move on to the next one. Uh, so watching DVDs with movies of kids is a very common experience when you, when you get them. Do you see this archetypal story in a lot of kids' movies too? I mean, you see it as a thread through your own, right? Yeah, the the, the greatest uh, kids' films. Uh, my fa- almost you know my top ten movies is the first Disney Pinocchio. I thought that was extraordinary, a huge amount of content in that, life lessons and stuff like that, mm. and definitely archetypes. Uh, oh, there's no question, and and usually there's a sort of dark darker undercurrents c- confronting things uh, that that we you know. D- you know that we're we're going to confront in life, and 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 that's the function of stories we tell kids, mm-hmm. and it's probably the function of stories we tell each other right through 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 life. I think to somehow create some sort of signal in the noise. Uh, the world is pretty chaotic; data is coming at you all the time, and information, and so on. How do you make sense of the world? And I think we do that through stories in all forms. I've noticed an interesting trend in a couple of films that I've seen recently, this hero archetype almost being replaced by a heroic team, a sort of a collaborative effort, which I think is particularly timely given the sorts of problems our world is facing now and requires a sort of collaborative effort. 
Is that something you can imagine, that, that archetype changing over time, that it, archetypal story? It always changes. Mm -hmm. um, stories adapt according to the time. Um, the, in, 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 in this Fury Road story, you know, we have uh, fight side by side, we have a female road warrior and a road warrior mm -hmm. who at the beginning of the story um, go at it. They basically are trying to kill each other because their survival depends on it. But then they are forced to come together, to work together, find some sort of mutual regard and through some through cooperation they uh they they survive mm. uh, so i think it's i think you're very perceptive there i think that's really really interesting and that's how we, what we do see in the world when mm. they when there is when when we come together to solve problems we're much more likely to solve them <laughs> than if we all have different opinions as to how things should be done. Especially given the scope of our problems now as a world, I think it's yeah. uh, especially interesting to see these stories like yours and I think of Hunger Games, for example, as another yeah. sort yeah. of yeah. Uh, story in that vein. Yeah. Many of your films also touch on the idea of the of the outcast, the outsider. Yes. Um, from Max, who's an anti-hero sort of loner. What attracts you to these sorts of characters? Well, they're kind of through the, through the eyes of the outsiders. We're able to look at the world again, and 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 I think that's their biggest value. We can go in through them. I mean, the main characters of stories are those through which we tend to experience the events of the story. So, the outsider is useful as as a as, as you know as a means to do that, but. Um, but I don't know. I, I guess each of us in our own way feel that we're outsiders, even if we've got a lot of friends and families around us. You know, we, in many ways this journey tends to be our own, whoever we are, mm -hmm. um, and it's through the interaction of others. Uh, so it's not hard to see why that, that's, that's the, the, the case. I mean, in the case of... The pig in Babe. He's the same character, virtually as as Max. He's an, he's the outsider. He's he's a, he's a character, a main character who's going to be eaten, but in some way, because of his special nature, he changes the world of the valley in which he lives. Um, I guess the same character as, as as the little penguin Mumble in in in, in Happy Feet. He's yeah. he's he's the guy. He is the the the, the one. The, the one character in that world who can't sing, but he can tap dance, and no one can even recognize what that is. <laughs> and uh, and 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 in the end, he he, he actually, um, you know, through his own through his own efforts, and in many ways by relinquishing his own self interest, he 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 basically changes his world for the good. How do you feel like an outsider? I, you know, I've. I know what it's like to be an outsider to the extent that um, I grew up in a in a isolated rural town. I came to the city um, when I studied medicine and was became interested in film. To the doctors, I was the guy who wanted to make films. To the filmmaker, I was the doctor, um, and I followed a kind of my own path. It was a it wasn't a typical path, and. The outsider is also, you know, you, you go to a new city, yeah. you're going to observe, or a new culture, you're going to observe that uh, much more acutely. If you're in the middle of it or grow up in, you, it, it almost becomes an un unconscious part of ourselves. So mm -hmm. I think most creative artists in one way have to have, have, to have the outsider's eyes. I don't know if you agree. Is that your experience? No, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think, like you said, it's, it's universal as an experience for one thing because yeah. we all are kind of... We're essentially alone, as sad as that yeah. is to say, you yeah. know, no matter how much community we have. But I think artists in particular yes. have to have that sort of outside um, perspective. And I think, you know, people often said to me, um, you know, what's the connection between being a doctor and a filmmaker? And I realized that in both cases, you're uh, looking at other human beings from many, many points of view. As a doctor, you're looking at them very broadly as a... As a group in epidemiology, you there've been times when I've 
as a junior doctor assisting in a neurosurgery operation, I'm literally touching the brain of someone I spoke to a few hours before. You're looking inside of people. Yeah. You're seeing them in childbirth and in death. And it's a very privileged position. And then you realise in a movie, just like on, on this movie, you, you you big massive wide shots of a battle. You're going right up into somebody's eyes and mm. and into or virtually into their brains and and so on. So you're shifting point of view all the time. And you, you, I think you're right. That, that's what that's what artists tend to do. Another message uh, in a lot of your films, like Babe and Happy Feet, is one of being true to yourself and true to your nature. For whether you're a tap dancing penguin or a or a pig that wants to be a sheep herding dog. Um, <laughs> What does Mad Max need to accept about himself? Oh, he's struggling. I mean, he's he's had, you know, he's 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 a he's a man kind of running away from his better self until one day that better self catches up to him. Mm. Uh, he's a he's a guy's been damaged by the world. He every time he engages with another human being. In, in a chaotic world, they're taken away from him uh, and it's too painful in a way. So he's, he's, uh, he figures the best thing to do is to wander the wasteland alone. But you can't do that. Hmm. Uh, you, you, you have to engage with others. That's almost the purpose of life. To, to, we're here, as Einstein said, for the sake of other men. Um, hmm. Well, man is here for the sake of other men, and uh, and uh, and 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 you know that, that that's true all of literature and history uh, that you know that 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 somehow despite the sense of each of each of us being individually alone, it is only by the engagement of others uh, we, uh, do we ever have any hope of, of of advancing as an individual, of growing and and as as a group. Is that what you're hoping people get out of this latest installation of Mad Max or is there something else you wanted to say about today there? Well, when you tell a story, you know, you lay out a story, uh, all the subtext that's there, particularly when it's a kind of an allegorical story, everyone takes from the story what they see. We mm -hmm. all would look at it and different things have different meaning to us. Uh, but there are obvious things about... Um, how to deal uh, with, you know, hope in a broken world where, where everyone is broken. Uh, is there any way that people can find a common humanity? And, and, and I think that's in, in there. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of subtext in this story uh, about, um, you, you know, dominance hierarchies, how you've got the, the Morton Joe, the warlord, uh, of the wasteland who basically controls all the resources, mm -hmm. water uh, from the citadel, gasoline from Gastown, um, bullets from the bullet farm, the munitions and so on, and b basically um, rules rules the wasteland. And everyone in one way or another is c a commodity branded by his own um, – by his own stamp on the back of the neck, even Max. So, yeah. so you know, there's resonances there, not only with today, yeah, uh, where there's a there's a you know disproportionate distribution of resources, but it's always the case throughout history. It's a story repeated over and over again. Mm. Well, thank you so much, George. That's great. Thank you. That's really enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs>